to uh, introduce uh, Christina Rigalski, one of um, our very good friends. Uh, we work with each other a lot and a lot of patients. Um, she's been a cardiovascular genetic counselor at the Cleveland Clinic for the past 11 years and collaborates closely with us and also the surgeons um, and taking care of a lot of genetic cardiovascular diseases, but her spe specific interest is in aortic diseases. And she has um, got her master's degree in genetic counseling from University of North Carolina at Greensboro um, and a very special interest in genetics of aortic disease and takes great pride in educating patients. Welcome, Christina. Thank you. <laughs> well, I hope I deserve uh, the applause afterwards, but uh, dealing with or seeing patients with aortic disease is what I like to do the most in my work, and I don't say that to other groups of cardiovascular genetic conditions. This is really what I like to do the most. Um, and for my talk today, it's about uh, genetic testing, interpreting of genetic test results. I've tried to make it at a very basic level. I certainly have the ability to, to go into the weeds about genetics of aortic disease with individual patients who like to do that. Um, but I'm gonna keep it as simple as possible and I'm happy to address more complex patients or questions if you have them. Um, so why is it important for us to understand uh, genetics? Well, for a long time, we really just relied on the clinical criteria to let us know if somebody had Marfan syndrome or not. But over the last 10 to 12 years, we've realized that actually doing genetic testing does have a lot of benefit for patients. There are conditions that have overlapping findings where we really do need to manage people differently. So it's important, uh, particularly if somebody has some um, characteristics that aren't exactly like Marfan syndrome, those are the people who really should consider genetic testing because you may in fact not have Marfan syndrome, you could have a different condition. Um, for the past 11 years, I've seen a lot of patients come in who tell me, oh, I've been told I have Marfan syndrome for a long time, and I ask, well, what criteria did they use to come up with that diagnosis? And many times there was no criteria at all. It may just be that you had an aortic aneurysm and you were young, so they decided you had Marfan syndrome whether or not you met criteria for anything, or they sent you on to anybody to find out if you had any criteria. So. Um, you know, I've seen a lot of uh, families like that as well, um, and sometimes it really is Marfan syndrome, and, and we can verify that for people, and, and there's uh, good use in doing that because we can actually help identify other family members who are at risk. If they don't meet clinical criteria, we can use a genetic test to figure out if, if they have it or not, and that really does help um, all your doctors know how best to care for you and what kind of screening you need and uh, when intervention should be um, done uh, for you or family members. So, you know, the basics about genetic testing, we usually use a blood sample. Sometimes we use a saliva sample or a cheek swab. Um, many insurance companies do cover the cost for genetic testing now. Um, the, the caveat to that is when you truly meet criteria for Marfan syndrome, sometimes they don't want to do it because they think that the clinical testing is, or the clinical evaluations are good enough, even though the, the, the most recent revised GET criteria indicate that you do have to rule out other overlapping conditions in order to actually get a diagnosis of Marfan syndrome, and sometimes the best way to do that is genetic testing. But that being said, we are able to get the vast majority of patients who have aortic uh, disease some <coughs> genetic testing. Whether or not it's exactly the genetic testing we would recommend to everybody, we can usually get insurance company to do some genetic testing. Um, often if we can pinpoint the genes that we are most interested in, you know, often what we're starting with is fibrillin, um, that is where we often can get insurance companies to pay for it. Now we have you know, over 15 genes that have been associated with aortic aneurysms. Insurance companies don't want to pay for all of that. 
even though it doesn't actually cost them more <laughs> to look at all of those genes than just one gene. In fact, five years ago, fibrillin testing cost $1,500. Now I, I can get 25 genes for $1,500 or less. So that shouldn't be the reason that insurance is dictating what genes we can order and which genes we can't, but it is in fact part of what they do. So we try to play the game and you know, ask for the genes that we can get covered. And sometimes we can still add on additional genes without additional cost, because we're playing the system. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, we try to get the testing that is best for all of our patients. Uh, sometimes that does mean paying out of pocket but there are now some labs that offer um, discounted out-of-pocket rates when insurance doesn't cover it. Um, the cheapest we can get aortic testing at this point without insurance is about $475. And results we usually get back in three to four weeks. So when we're doing genetic testing, we always like to think about uh, what is the outcome uh, of this result? And there are a number of outcomes that we can get through genetic testing. The most straightforward is a positive or abnormal test result, and those are often sometimes described as pathogenic or deleterious mutations. And these are the kind that really can confirm what the diagnosis is. We found a change in a gene that we know gives us an explanation for what's going on. Um, we often think of a gene as a code that has a typical pattern. In this example, you know, I used the big red dog as the, like the DNA, but in somebody who has a mutation, their DNA might actually read the big. The end of it is totally missing, but that's the type of change that we can confirm uh, through genetic testing and have a positive result. Sometimes we get a negative result. Even in some people who meet criteria for Marfan syndrome, we get a negative result. It's not quite as common, but you know, 10% of the time or so, we can get a negative result in somebody who meets clinical criteria. Um, but even in general, thinking about all aortic diseases, you know, it's actually more common for us to get a negative result than a positive result at this point. Um, but it, that is not the case when we're just thinking about somebody with Marfan syndrome. With Marfan syndrome, we get a positive result about 90% of the time, but when we account for everybody who comes with aortic disease, you know, we're probably getting a positive result somewhere between 20 and 30% of the time in highly selected people. And out of everybody I see, it's probably closer to 10%. Negative result doesn't mean it's not genetic, because we know we don't know all of the genetic causes for aortic disease. Um, and some types of mutations aren't able to be detected with our current technology. So as technology advances, we probably will identify mutations that weren't previously identified, and as new genes are identified, we'll, of course, then be able to identify more as well. And then the third type is the most challenging type in many ways of genetic testing, and that's a variant of unknown significance. It neither confirms nor denies a diagnosis. It's a change from what is typical, but um, we all have changes in our genetic material that make us unique. The challenge with rare conditions is that, is that often, even within a family, it's unique, so that is, equals a rare finding. So rare findings are hard to interpret. Some are easy when it's like that first example, the positive, like if we found you know, part of the gene was going to be, or part of the gene product was going to be cut off. That's a finding whether or not it's the only time it's been seen. We're highly suspicious that it's going to cause a problem. But there are some things that change things minimally, and we can't just say it's a problem or not a problem. And that's an example like the big red dog has changed to the big red hog. Well, if it, you know you wanted a pot belly pig as a as a uh, pet instead of a dog, that might work out just fine or in some situations that may cause a big difference, like you have a big giant you know, pig in your house or something. <laughs> so there are now uh, many genes available for testing. Um, when we can do it large panel, we're often testing for 25 or more genes associated with aortic disease. Again, we'll pinpoint it down if we can. Um, uh, you know, fibrillin is the most common gene associated with Marfan syndrome. 
Uh, over the last 10 years, many more genes have been identified that kind of fall into the low yeast eat spectrum or the familial aortic aneurysm and, and dissections <coughs> category. Of course, the gene for vascular Ehlers-Danlos syndrome is called 3A1. And then these large panels also include other genes that may not actually be associated with aortic aneurysms but have clinical overlap with Marfan syndrome so that by having these on the panel, if we're seeing somebody who has skeletal findings of Marfan syndrome, we might actually be able to uh, find a cause that is different from Marfan syndrome but has the skeletal overlap. So th some things don't actually change very much. So if you previously had genetic testing and you had an abnormal result that was clearly a positive um, finding that nobody was really suspicious that it, you know, it was unlikely to cause your, your medical problems, then you probably don't need um, any updated testing or anything like that. Family members can be tested for that type of change if they haven't already. And when we test other family members, if they inherit, if they do not inherit the, the mutation, then we don't recommend ongoing uh, clinical evaluations for aortic disease or any other, other findings associated with whatever uh, gene mutation was found in the family. But if somebody does inherit the mutation, then we actually can you know, make appropriate recommendations based on whatever gene <coughs> mutation was identified in the family. But some things do change, and that primarily has been in, in technology, the type of genetic testing we offer, the number of genes, and, and research, because research has identified new genes. So you should think about reaching out to genetics again um, if you've never had genetic testing before and are interested in it. I always recommend genetic counseling before having genetic testing. Um, or if you previously underwent genetic testing and it was negative, you should talk to a genetics professional to see if there's any reason to consider new testing, whether you, you know, had a limited number of genes tested or um, previous technology was used to, to do the genetic testing, then a new genetic test might be warranted. Um, or if you're interested in um, using test results for family planning, it's a good time to reach out to genetics to make sure that what we knew about that mutation is still the same and, and talk about um, reproductive choices. And then if you previously had a variant of unknown significance, it's important to reach back out to genetics every so often just to find out is, is something new known about this variant? Has, has our interpretation of that variant changed over time? So the new technology that we are using for these large genetic panels is something called next generation sequencing. So they can look at many genes all at once through one genetic test. It allows for many genes to be tested quickly, and that is what has prompted the reduction in the cost of genetic testing at this point too. The challenge with uh, next generation sequencing and testing many genes at once is that the more genes you test, the more DNA is evaluated, the higher chance you will find something you don't know what it means. So that in particular is one of the reasons that uh, insurance companies don't like large panels, but that is why I would tell you, go see a genetic counselor. We know how to deal with variants. We don't tell you that it's a problem if we don't know it's a problem, but that is a problem sometimes when other providers uh, uh, interpret genetic test results. So I just wanted to use a couple case examples of how genetic testing um, was used in a, a couple families that I've seen. So this is a 22-year-old man um, who had an aortic replacement at the age of 19. And you know, at, at the time he had his aortic replacement at an outside institution, he was suspected of having Marfan syndrome because he was very tall, he had long fingers, and he was flexible. Um, but no further evaluations had been done at that time. He had multiple family members who he reported to me had valve replacement, but he didn't know of anybody else who had aortic replacement. He did undergo genetic testing. We did uh, start with um, uh, FBN1 for Marfan syndrome, and it did, in fact, come back positive, confirming that it really was Marfan syndrome. So this is an example, this is his test result. Um, you can see here, we tested just for the gene associated with Marfan syndrome. This was a number of years ago before we were widely using panels, but he was a good example of somebody that we could just start with fibrillin. 
And um, this is the genetic change. So um, the C number, it corresponds to the DNA. So at the 1,546 letter, in most people, it's a C. And this young man, um, his, in his code, it was a T. So that actually results in um, the product of the, of the gene, the protein, actually being shortened. So it is like that example originally, the big, uh, it would just say the big rather than the big red dog. So uh, this confirmed his diagnosis and allowed other family members to be tested. The next person in the family I actually saw was his 51-year-old uncle, who actually did tell me that he did have aortic replacement <laughs> in his 30s. Uh, <laughs> the 22-year-old just didn't know. <laughs> Um, so he, and, and in fact, he had recently seen an ophthalmologist who identified uh, lens dislocation in one eye as well. So he actually met criteria for Marfan syndrome, but did undergo genetic testing, and, and it did reveal that he had that same mutation that was found in his nephew. By uh, this uh, young man and this uh, man being tested for the same mutation, we actually, by default, know that his dad actually carried that mutation also. And he hadn't had any aortic evaluation in 20 years. So we, even by testing other family members, sometimes we learn things. Um, and actually, I have not been, I'm, these, these uh, patients don't follow up with me routinely, so I hope he's getting evaluated. We've cer we certainly discussed that to some length with both of the family members, but I actually don't know that. And then this man actually underwent genetic testing to confirm that he had it so that his kids could be evaluated. And then we did confirm that his daughter, so the circles are females, the squares are males. Um, so we did learn that his daughter also carried the mutation. So then I know she is being properly evaluated. And then the second case um, here is a, a 57-year-old man who, um, again, had been told for a long time that he had Marfan syndrome because he underwent an aortic replacement at the age of 48. He was initially uh, found to have an aneurysm at the age of 46 when a murmur was identified. And uh, when we met with him, the, the findings that he had were he had a long face and a high, a high arch palate. The roof of his mouth was high. But he didn't really have a lot of findings that made us think he had Marfan syndrome. So we offered him... Um, so the other people in the family, I should say, are colored in because they also had aortic involvement, including his 19-year-old son. So our patient and his brother had died from an aortic dissection. So um, our patient did undergo genetic testing, and he was actually found to have a TGFBR2 mutation. So that is consistent with uh, familial aortic aneurysms or low East Eat syndrome. And he actually has some overlap in between. Um, these ones are hard to say what you should really call them. Um, but uh, his family likes to call it that he has R the R2-D2 thing because they can't keep track of the <laughs> TGF-BR. <laughs> so in this case, his genetic finding um, showed, whoops, showed that at the 914th letter where there's usually a T, there's an A, and that just results in the change of an amino acid, which sometimes those types of changes can be a problem and sometimes they aren't, but in this case it is. <coughs> and it did allow us to test other family members, including finding that his son um, did have the mutation as we suspected since he had aortic dilatation. And because of the finding of the TGFBR2 mutation, he was offered um, early um, aortic uh, replacement. I, I believe he actually had his aorta replaced around four centimeters. So why is it important to make sure that we're dealing with the right condition or if it's not the right condition, find out what it is so that we can make the right uh, recommendations for how to screen you and family members and to prevent complications? Um, you know, there are overlapping features with many of these conditions. And sometimes, um, you know, we've been surprised with genetic testing when we didn't think that somebody looked like they had a connective tissue disorder and genetic testing actually showed that it was. <laughs> so um, it can actually be helpful. I would say I don't usually get surprised, but recently I have been surprised. So I'm trying to uh, make myself learn from that, that I, I shouldn't draw as many conclusions as sometimes I, I have.